histories of murder. The law of murder involves a plethora of case law and is set out in common law, which means that most of the rules concerning the law of murder were devised through case law. The legal definition of murder is the unlawful killing of a human being in the queen's peace with malice aforethought. Now let's dissect this definition to identify the actus reus and the mens rea of murder. Let me repeat the definition for you and this time I want you to identify actus reus and mens rea. Here's the definition. Murder is the unlawful killing of a human being in the queen's peace with malice aforethought. The actus reus of murder consists of the unlawful killing of a human being in the queen's peace. The mens rea of murder is malice aforethought. The element of intentionality although originally was termed malice aforethought, but it required neither malice nor premeditation. This malice aforethought has been interpreted by the courts as the intention to kill or intention to cause grievous bodily harm. Because murder is generally defined as an intent to cause serious bodily harm or injury alone or with others, combined with the death arising from that intention, there are certain circumstances where the death will be treated as murder even if the defendant did not wish to kill the actual victim. This is called transferred malice and arises in two common cases. Number one. The defendant intended serious harm to one or more persons, but an unintended other person dies as a result. Number two, several people shared an intent to do serious harm and the victim dies because of the action of any of those involved. For example, if another person goes further than expected or performs an unexpectedly lethal action. A murder conviction carries a mandatory life sentence. The judge passing the sentence cannot pass a lesser sentence no matter how mitigating the circumstances might be. However, there exist three partial defenses to murder which may reduce the conviction to voluntary manslaughter, which carries a maximum sentence of life and thus allow the judge's discretion on sentencing. We will discuss these three partial defenses when we discuss the topic of voluntary manslaughter. Now. Let's look more closely at the actus reus of murder. The actus reus of murder is the unlawful killing of a human being in the queen's peace. We will look at each element of this definition in depth. We will look at what constitutes an unlawful killing. We will look at the definition of human being. And then we will see what it is meant by in the queen's peace. Unlawful killing can be committed by an act or an omission. Because it can be committed through omission too, remember that the case law pertaining to omission is relevant here. Also recall the topic of causation from previous lectures and recall that the murder is a resulting crime. Therefore, causation must also be established. So, for the killing to amount to murder by defendant, at the time of death, the defendant's acts or omission must be operating and most substantial cause of death with no novus actus intervenience. This means no new act breaking the chain of causation. Thus, the defendant cannot choose how the victim is to act nor what personality to have. No matter the personality of the victim, it is assumed that the defendant expects the victim to try to escape. If he or she dies in that attempt, the chain of causation is not broken or try to fight back and so escalate the extent of the violence between them or seek medical treatment for the injuries sustained and even if the mistakes are made by the medical staff this will not break the chain of causation unless the mistakes become the most substantial cause of death. As discussed before there are conflicting authorities on the above point R. V. Jordan and R. V. Smith. R. V. Smith sets well, with the rule that the act must be enough to render the defendant's act no longer a substantial and operating cause. In this case, the defendant, a soldier, got in a fight at an army barracks and stabbed another soldier. The injured soldier was taken to the medics, but was dropped twice en route. Once there, the treatment given was described as palpably wrong. They failed to diagnose that his lung had been punctured. 
the soldier died. The defendant was convicted of murder and appealed, contending that if the victim had received the correct medical treatment, he would not have died. It was held that the stab wound was an operating cause of death and therefore the conviction was upheld. In such cases, the courts are reluctant to let defendants complain that their victim would have survived if they had received proper medical care. So R.V. Jordan is a rare case. In R.V. Jordan, 1956, the defendant stabbed the victim. The victim was taken to the hospital where he was given antibiotics after showing an allergic reaction to them. He was also given an excessive amount of intravenous liquids. He died of pneumonia eight days after admission to the hospital. At the time of death, his wounds were starting to heal and it was held that the victim died of the medical treatment and not the stab wound and the defendant was not liable for his death. In short, any contingency that is foreseeable will maintain the chain. Putting it the other way, only some unexpected acts by the third party, which places the original attack as a merely background context or some unpredictable natural phenomenon will break the chain. Some killings may be classed as lawful. For example, killing in self-defense, also, when the death penalty was implemented, such state-ordered executions would be classed as lawful. Soldiers and police may kill in the course of their duties, but will be liable for murder if they go beyond their duty or use excessive force, such as R.V. Clegg. The defendant was a soldier serving in Northern Ireland. He was manning a vehicle checkpoint along with four other soldiers. Other soldiers were stationed along the road before and after the place where the defendant was stationed. A car approached the first checkpoint and slowed down. It then accelerated at great speed with its highlights on full beam. Another soldier ordered the car to stop but to no avail. All four soldiers at the checkpoint opened fire on the car. The defendant fired three bullets as the car was approaching and the final bullet as the car was driving away. The final shot proved to be fatal, hitting the passenger who was in the back seat of the car. The car had been stolen and contained young joyriders, not terrorists. The defendant was convicted of murder and appealed to the Court of Appeals. His appeal was rejected on the grounds that in firing the last shot, after the danger had passed, he had used excessive force in the circumstances. Interestingly, doctors in some circumstances may lawfully kill. I have an interesting case for you to explain this point. The case allows a doctor to hasten the death as a secondary intention using analgesic medications such as heroin and morphine. John Botkin Adams, who was also known as Dr. Death, was a doctor who was charged with murder by easing the passing of elderly patient by giving drugs calculated to hasten their deaths. It was said that a doctor has no special defense, but he is entitled to do all that is proper and necessary to relieve pain, even if the measures he take may incidentally shorten life. That is a secondary intention. On these grounds, the defendant was acquitted. This case was the first to formulate a double effect in respect of the mens rea of murder. Liability for murder can be avoided if medicine which is beneficial to the patient is given despite the knowledge that death will occur as a side effect. But remember, assisted suicide is prohibited by Section 21 of the Suicide Act 1961 and voluntary euthanasia is considered to be murder under UK law. The House of Commons in 2015 considered a legislation that would give terminally ill patients a right for assisted death. The assisted dying bill would allow doctors to prescribe a lethal dose to terminally ill patients judged to have six months or less to live and who request it. Other situations where doctors have been held to have lawfully killed are situations where the treatment was withdrawn as in Airedale Hospital Trustees v. Bland, 1993, and where they had a defense of necessity, such as in Re A 2001, 
a case of conjoined twins. We have discussed several situations and cases related to the first part of the definition of murder, which is unlawful killing. Now we will discuss the second element of actus reus of murder, which requires that the victim should be a human being. On the face of it, it appears simple as we all know what human being means. This obviously excludes animals, we all know it. But if I ask you at what point does one become a human being, you will be confused. What do you think is the status of baby in the mother's womb? Religious definitions and beliefs aside, a fetus is not considered a human being under the law of murder. So therefore, a person killing a fetus cannot be charged of murder. It may sound a little weird, but I want you to wear your lawyer hat and listen to this case. I also want you to keep in mind that there are other crimes that a person killing a fetus can be charged with. Okay, so the case goes like this. In Attorney General Reference Number 3 of 1994, the appellant had stabbed his girlfriend, who was between 22 and 24 weeks pregnant, with their child, in the face, back, and in the abdomen. 17 days after the stabbing, she went into premature labor. The baby died after 121 days from the effects of premature birth. The appellant was charged with murder after the baby's death. At his trial, the judge ruled that on evidence, neither murder nor manslaughter was proved and directed the jury to acquit the appellant. The Lords held that where an assailant stabbed a pregnant woman with the intention of harming her alone, but as a result of attack, she went into premature labor and her child, although born alive, subsequently died owing to its prematurity, the assailant could be convicted of manslaughter, but not murder. So now you know to some extent as to when does one become a human being. The next case discusses the question, when does one ceases to be a human being? A person ceases to be a human being when their brain stem ceases to be active, irrespective of whether they are being kept alive by artificial means. In R. V. Malkarek and Steele, 1981, two separate appeals were heard together. In Malkarek, the defendant had stabbed his wife. In Steele, the defendant was accused of sexually assaulting and beating a woman over the head with a stone. In both cases, the victim had been taken to hospital and placed on life support machines. The doctors in the respective cases later switched off the life support machines as both victims were not showing any activity in their brain stem. The defendant sought to argue that the doctor's actions constituted a novus actus intervenience which broke the chain of causation. It was held that the test of death is where the brain stem has died. Thus, at the time of switching off the machine, the victims were already dead. The doctors could not therefore be the cause of death. Defendants' actions were the cause of death. This brings us to the discussion of about a situation where a person is disabled. Disability no matter how extreme, does not prevent a person from being a human being. The third aspect of actus reus of murder is in Queen's Peace. This basically excludes the killing of alien enemies in the time of war. That's basically all you need to know about the actus reus of murder. In the next lecture, I will discuss the mens rea of murder.